My anchor holds. Grab your hymn book. Let's all stand and sing together. Unless your child is sleeping on your lap. <laughs> all right, hymn 146. Let's sing together now. Though the angry surges roll on my tempest-driven soul, I am peaceful for I know wildly though the winds may blow, I've an anchor safe and sure that can evermore endure. And it holds my anchor, holds, blow your wildest and O gale, on my bark so small and frail, by his grace I shall not fail, for anchor holds, my anchor holds, him 146 on the second. Mighty tides about me sweep, perils lurk within the deep. Angry clouds or shade the sky, and the tempest rises high. Still I stand the tempest shock, for my anchor grips the rock. And it holds, my anchor holds, blow your wildest and O gale. On my bark so small and frail, by his grace I shall not fail. For my anchor holds, my anchor holds. I can feel the anchor fast as I meet each sudden blast. And the cable, though unseen, bears a heavy strain between. Through the storm I safely ride till the turning of the tide. And it holds, my anchor holds, blow your wildest and on gale. So small and frail, by His grace I shall not fail. For my anchor holds, my anchor holds. Troubles almost whelm the soul. Griefs like billows o'er me roll. Tempters seek to lure astray. Storms obscure the light of day. But in Christ I can be bold. I've an anchor that shall hold. And it holds, my anchor holds, blow your wildest and O gale. On my bark so small and frail, by His grace I shall not fail. For my anchor holds, my anchor holds. Amen. Turn to page number 69 for our second hymn this morning. Hymn number 69, On Jordan's, okay, On Jordan's Stormy Banks I Stand. Hymn number 69. <coughs> On Jordan's Stormy Banks I Stand and Cast a Wishful Lie. To Canaan's fair and happy land, where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. 
All o'er those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. There God of the sun forever reigns and scatters night away. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. No chilling winds nor poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore. Sickness and sorrow, pain and death are felt and feared no more. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom rest? Sing it now. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. Amen. You may be seated. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Brother Andrew, uh, Brother Aaron said I have a bigger mouth than you. I just, he said I'm a lot louder than you are. I don't think he meant that as a compliment, though, really. but Just a stated matter of fact. Yeah, keep dreaming. Let me make sure I have the right one here. All right, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking for something here. Make sure I have the right. Uh, yep, this is the right one. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, just we'll have lunch and then we'll probably do some, uh, have some prayer time. All right. Next service, uh, have the men stand up again and pray and do some hymns, and, and the reason, I mean, obviously we need to pray more anyway, but um, I have some specific prayers for Brother Nate, and we want that house uh, and everything to go through, okay? we got to pray him here, amen, every step of the way. we got to pray him through that, and we need to come together. Last week we already seen God answer some prayers. Uh, there was like two or three specific prayers that, we had, that Nate had asked for, and those prayers were answered last week. I mean, it was answered Monday, right after... Right after we had prayed, I mean, Monday, it was like he had his answers right there. We need to keep praying, amen? And uh, obviously on our own, but also uh, we need to pray together as a, as a church and as a body to come together and pray. It's very important that we do that. Uh, you know, and, and right now I feel led by the Lord that in the next hour we'll take that time and we will do that together as men praying. And, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to bring you another message. I probably won't. We'll probably pray, sing some hymns. I'm not sure what we'll do. We'll let the Lord, we'll let the Lord lead. Amen. And give some testimonies, some street preaching testimonies. I want to bring that before your face all the time. And, uh, and so it can be on your heart to pray for us. You may not go out. You may stay by the stuff. Amen. But you need to pray while, while you're by the stuff. You need to stay and, and you need to pray and ask the Lord to, uh, 
to speak to hearts and uh, as we go out and do his work. Uh, let's see here. I'm just looking for something here because uh, I didn't get that in my text here. Um, turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5, please. And I'm going to look for something here while you're over there. If that other one was all right. Oh, here we go. It was that one. All right. Now, uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about uh, CS Lewis here. And uh, this is a, a good warning that See, the thing is is that I I've heard this. I've heard a lot about CS Lewis. And I I've heard folks follow him. And they listen. They they read his books. Obviously, he's deceased, but uh, they read his books. And um, a lot of people think he's a good Christian. He was a good Christian. I believe C.S. Lewis is in hell. It's exactly where I believe he is. So you're making a very strong judgment. Well, uh, what you believe and what you follow will prove whose you are. Okay, doctrine matters. It's very important. Today, there are thousands, there are millions of people today. C.S. Lewis is one of the most popular authors out there among evangelicals today. He is one of the most popular authors. Um, Disney took the Chronicles of Narnia. We all know how good I feel about Disney. And uh, took the Chronicles of Narnia, and they made their version of the movies. My wife had told me when she was a kid, or actually when I first met her too, she was almost a kid really, but uh, when, when I first, I mean she was only 18, right? Uh, but uh, um, anyway, when I first, when I first met her, uh, you know, they, they watched one of those movies called The Silver Chair. Now these are Christians that were watching these movies. Okay, you've seen it. Uh, how many people, just a show of hands, have seen anything about C.S. Lewis or read anything that he has written? Anybody? Okay, so there's there's quite a few people here that have. So that that would mean that this is this is very pertinent to 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 understand for people to understand. Now this is the first message. I think there's going to be three of them on C.S. Lewis's writings. And everything or on C.S. This one is going to be uh, on his doctrines. Well, I because if you can get. I, the man is in hell by what he believed, okay? He did not believe in the Christ of the Bible. He did not follow him. And I'm going to show you what this man believed. He's a very dangerous man. He's a very dangerous man to follow. I, won't, I, won't, I, I will say this, that um, it has been said by some high-level witches that were born again, that got saved, that, 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 that C.S. Lewis's writings were used uh, to introduce people into the occult. To introduce, And it makes sense if you understand. But see, you know what's lacking today? discernment. And then pastors don't want to stand up and say, well, C.S. Lewis was wicked as hell. He's a devil, and here's the proof of it. They don't want to do that. Why? Well, because it'll make somebody mad. It'll upset somebody. Uh, it might hurt your feelings. Um, you know, might make you feel... Well, you know what? Um, I'm more concerned with you being entertained by devils and reading occultic material and witchcraft than I am you being mad at me. Okay? You need the truth. And if you were wrong, do you know if that all you have to do is repent of that and get it right? If you allowed your children to read these things and watch these things and be a part of these, then you can repent and you can get it right. And you know what? You could be like, hey, I didn't know that. I was deceived. I didn't know. Now I know and I'm going to do right. See how easy that is? It's not very hard. It just takes dropping that pride that you have and admit, hey, I was wrong. Instead of getting mad at the preacher, look at what the material is and say, you know what? I was wrong. I was deceived. Amen. And now I can do right. Now I can, now I can have a free conscience because you know what? God forgave me. And you know what? You can, you, can, you can get rid of all those things. You say, you know, 
Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The title of this message is C.S. Lewis, A Lion in a Witch's Wardrobe. Now, I, I do happen to believe this man was a witch. I, I, do, I, I, I make no bones about it. I really believe he's a witch. Now, you, you're, you're going to think I'm crazy because, oh, but he said Jesus and God, and, and uh, oh, that's right. Like everybody does on the street, and we know they're all saved. Everybody I walk, everybody I talk to, we know they're all saved. <gasps> I, just, I just wish God's people would get some discernment. It's just so sad. Ah. <sighs> Paul says in first in second Corinthians chapter eleven verse number twelve, uh, verse number thirteen, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. How about that? Turn to second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse number first, verse number thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. I know you think it's amazing, don't you? But Paul says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Paul says, listen, there are some deceitful workers. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. So is it no great thing that his ministers be transformed the same way? and that people follow them and say, hey, these people must be the servants of the Most High. They must be, but the Apostle Paul says, no, they're not. They're deceitful workers. They're false apostles. Now let's look at C.S. Lewis concerning his salvation. I want, I, now a lot of this is going to be quotes, but you know that I like to use people's own words. I don't like to use just accusatory statements and say, well, that guy was this. I want to use their own words, what they wrote, what they said about themselves, what they believed. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis claims that Christ rejecting Buddhists can be saved. Oh, come on. What did he say? Well, here's what he said. There are people who do not accept the full Christian doctrine about Christ, but who are so strongly attracted by him that they are his, they are his in a much deeper sense than they themselves understand. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity, and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. For example, a Buddhist of goodwill may be led to concentrate more and more on the Buddhist teachings about mercy and to leave in the background, though he might still say he believed, the Buddhist teaching on certain other points. Many of the good pagans long before Christ's birth, may have been in this position. C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, 1960, page 176 to 177. What did he just say to you? Uh, he said something like another witch said. Well, who's that witch? Billy Graham. There's a wideness to God's mercy, Schuler said. There's a wideness. So you're saying that people from all, all, all religions and every... I'm so glad to hear you say that, says the witch in the cathedral building. I'm so glad to hear you say that. That's wonderful. It's the same message. Why? Because they work for the same person. He says this, I think that every prayer which is sincerely made, even to a false God or to a very imperfectly conceived true God, is accepted by the true God and that Christ saves many who do not think they know him. Yeah, it is where Billy Graham, that's exactly where he got it. I mean, did you hear what he said? If you just pray to a God, I mean, it's just, and God's going to say, well, he's sincere. So as long as you're sincere, it's like Brother John, I, I told him when we were, we were walking here, he likes to always say this to me, and he's right about it. It's funny. I was like, Brother, I don't know how to get back to my car. And he goes, well, as long as you're sincere, always lead to your car. You'll find your way back. I'm like, Brother, I'm in Minneapolis. I don't got time for that. That's what he was saying. 
Well, as long as you're sincere, as long as you're sincere, Pastor, you'll make it back to your car. Always lead back to your car. As long as you're sincere, you'll find your way back. Do you see what he was saying? That's exactly what he was saying. He was like, that's what? That is C.S. Lewis Christianity. That's his mere Christianity. That guy's in hell. Oh, by the way, that was the letters of C.S. Lewis. Harper wrote 2001, page 428. Because <clears throat> then somebody will email me like, I want the documentation of that. Well, it's not hard to find. It's in like 100 places. Ah, listen to this one. Here's another one. You may picture me alone in that room in Magdalene, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted for even a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. Now listen to this. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. And perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. Wait a minute. By the way, nobody that gets saved is reluctant to get saved. Do you understand that? Where do you find in the Bible where somebody's like, man, I didn't want it, but he came on me and I was like, uh -huh. no, I don't want it. What does he say? And why is he saying God? Why isn't he saying Christ? Why doesn't he say Jesus Christ? Because he's a cultic and he's, and he's talking to you about the God of this world. I'm telling you, this man is a witch. He was a witch. He is an absolute witch. That's what he is. By the way, claiming to believe in God is not conversion. The devils believe and tremble. Amen. That's not conversion. That's not repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He says this, Some heathen may belong to God without knowing it. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah, they don't know it. They just belong to God. They belong to the Antichrist. Yeah, they belong to the devil, the God of this world and they don't know it, sure. If you read his writings, why do you think witches use these? Do you see? Do you see the witchcraft in this? That's why witches use these writings. Listen to what he's saying and how he's saying it. It's very crafty. And you could use it for anything. Ugh. Anyway, I don't know what that was about. That was really strange. Anyway, he says this, there are three things that spread the Christ life to us. There are three things that spread the Christ life to us. Baptism, belief, and the mysterious action, which different Christians call by different names. Holy communion, the mass, the Lord's Supper. End quote. What was he saying to you? Well, basically, he's saying that the Mass is the same as the Lord's Supper. But what did we learn today? Paul said you can't take the, doc, the, the, the Supper of the Devil and the Supper of God. You can't mix those two together. They don't mix. They, they, they can't be mixed. You can't commune with, the, with uh, the cup of devils and the cup of God. You can't do that. That's what C.S. Lewis is saying. Do you see where Kirk Cameron is getting this garbage? You see what he's saying when he's saying that, oh, well, back then Rome did this and, and, and the saints, they weren't saints. They didn't, there's no, salvation does not come through communion. It does not come through, through the Lord's table. That's right. There's one door. It's the shepherd. It's Jesus Christ. What's this guy saying? He's selling you the sacraments. Why? Well, because you, what you don't know, some of you may not know, is that witches do the same thing that the Mass does. They have the same ceremony. They practice the same ceremony as the Mass. They have their blood sacrifice. They have their blood. They have their bread. They, they, have, they do the same thing as the Mass. It's, I mean, I'm telling you, it's exactly the same thing as witchcraft. It's just they change some of the names. I mean, where do you think Constantine got it from?
He didn't get it from the Scriptures. He says this, a Christian can lose the Christ life, which has been put into him, and he has to make efforts to keep it. There are people, a great many of them, who are slowly ceasing to be Christians. Page 162. He says this, You can say that Christ died for our sins. You may say that the Father has forgiven us because Christ has done for us what we ought to have done. It sounds kind of good, doesn't it? Then listen. You may say that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. You may say that Christ has defeated death. They are all true. If any of them do not appeal to you, leave it alone and get on with the formula that does. Formula? Now see, witches have formulas. Salvation is not a formula. What did he just tell you? Just do whatever the formula states. Just follow the formula that works for you. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. And whatever you do, do not start quarreling with other people because they use a different formula from yours. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you understand where the indoctrination of relativity came in? Right there. That's relativity. Your truth, my truth, your truth, my truth. No, the truth here. C.S. Lewis didn't believe that because he's a witch. <clears throat> he was a lion in a witch's wardrobe. <laughs> ah. Lewis said this, the central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. Theories as to how it did this are another matter. Any theories we build up as to how Christ's death did all this, all this are, in my view, quite secondary. Mere Christianity, page 54, 55, and 56. I think that every prayer which is sincerely made even to a false God or to a very imperfectly conceived true God is accepted by the true God and that Christ saves many who do not think they know him. Next, his views on heaven and hell. Anyway, by the way, do you see that he doesn't believe in Christ? Do you understand that? He doesn't believe on Christ. He does not believe the Bible. These are quotes. You check them out. You, you go look at his writings. Check them out. They're not hard to find. They're right there. I mean, it's, it's easy. How about his views on heaven and hell? Listen to this. I can't believe how many Reformed Christians read his stuff. I, I, I'm shocked that how many Reformed Christians lap all of his stuff up and act like it's it, it shocks me how many do. And Baptists and everybody else, that they just love C.S. Lewis. Oh, he's great! Okay, listen to what he says here. In his letters to Malcolm, he wrote this. I believe in purgatory. The right view returns magnificently in Newman's dream. There, if I remember rightly, the saved soul at the very foot of the throne begs to be taken away and cleansed. It cannot bear for a moment longer with its darkness to affront that light. Our souls demand purgatory, don't they? Page 110 to 111. Uh, Cardinal Newman, I think. Cardinal Newman, I believe, is who he's talking about. <clears throat> hell is a... Okay, listen to this. So what did he believe about hell? This, oh, now, now, where did we hear this? Hell is a state of mind. Never said it. Never said it. You never said a truer word. And every state of mind left to itself, every shutting up of the creature within the dungeon of its own mind is in the end hell. C.S. Lewis, The Great Divorce, page 65. Um, no, hell is not a state of mind. I, this verse goes through my head right now. What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause to warn people of these things? Is there not a cause when you see the people of God completely seduced by a witch? Right. 
If all hell's miseries together entered the consciousness of yon we yellow bird on the bow here, they would be swallowed up without trace, as if one drop of ink had been dropped into that great ocean to which your terrestrial Pacific itself is only a molecule. Whatever that meant. That's one of those witch. That's one of those witches things that you just don't get. It's like reading the Kabbalah. I don't recommend it. But it's like reading the Kabbalah. It's like, what in the world are they saying? Right? You try to read the Kabbalah, which I don't recommend. But I'm just saying, if you try to read the Kabbalah and you try to read it, it just nothing, none of it makes sense. It would if you were a witch and you had the spirit of Antichrist in you. Then you're like, whoa, this all makes sense. But to us, it's like, man, this is insane. It's, it looks like ramblings. Oh, no, it's not ramblings. Exactly, like the Bible looks to them. These things are spiritually discerned in the book. If you have the spirit of Antichrist, you understand what witches are saying. He believed that purgatory was a process by which the work of redemption continues and first perhaps begins to be noticeable after death. So he believed, that was page 246, 247. He believed that pur in purgatory, he, he believed it. He believed that's... He says this, is judgment not final? Is there really a way out of hell into heaven? It depends on the way you're using the words. Do you see? See, to us, it's like, what's going on? This guy's foolish. No, he's a crafty, wicked witch. That's what he is, and you just don't get it. You don't get the level of deception what he's doing. It depends on the way you use the words. If they leave that gray town behind, it will not have been hell. To any that, any that leaves it, it is purgatory. And perhaps you had better not call this country heaven, not deep heaven, you understand. In this book, Lewis taught that the questions such as f the finality of men's destiny and purgatory and eternal destinies cannot be understood in this present life, and we should not fret about them although it should be noted that he was terrified at his death. He was terrified to die. I would be too if I was him. You can know nothing of the end of all things, or nothing expressible in those terms. It may be, as the Lord said to the Lady Julian, that all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. But it's ill taking, it's ill, but it's ill talking of such questions because they are too terrible, sir. Because they are too terrible, sir? No, because all answers deceive. See, that's a witch, that's a witch speaking right there. If you understand what, what he's doing there, that's exactly what he's doing. It's wicked. It is a bunch of garbage. The great divorce, page 140 to 150. That's the Kindle location on that. He says this, all the script, now listen to what he says about heaven. All the scriptural imagery, harps, crowns, gold, etc., is of course a merely symbolic attempt to express the inexpressible. Musical instruments are mentioned because for many people, not all, music is the thing known in the present life which most strongly suggests ecstasy and infinity. Crowns are mentioned to suggest the fact that those who are united with God in eternity share his splendor and power and joy. Gold is mentioned to suggest the timelessness of heaven. Gold does not rust in the preciousness of it. He's saying that heaven is just, that those things are just figurative. They're not real. Like there's not, heaven is really, in my opinion, what he's stating is heaven is a state of mind. That's what he's saying, just like hell is a state of mind. That's what he's saying. Next, Lewis believed in prayers for the dead. He said this, of course I pray for the dead. The action is so spontaneous, so all inevitable, that only the most compulsive theological case against it would deter me. And I hardly know how the rest of my prayers would survive if those for the dead were forbidden. Now we're going to get to, the, to a real important part of this. Concerning the Father and Jesus Christ, what did he believe about Christ and what did he believe about God in heaven? He said this, God often makes prizes of humans who have given their life for causes he thinks bad on, on the monstrosly, monstros, monstrosly, sophistical ground that the human thought, I'm going to start over with this because, man, this guy, man, see, that's what, 
Yeah, monstrously, thank you. Okay, God often prizes of humans who have, who have given their lives for causes. He, he thinks bad on the monstrously... I can't say that word. <laughs> monstrously sophistical ground that the humans thought them good and were following the best they knew. So what was he saying there? He's saying God looks down and he sees... God looks down and he sees even if you were serving the devil that you were doing it for a good cause, so you really meant good by it. So he's going to bless you for it because your heart, right? You followed your heart, right? You followed the best you knew. Who does that sound like? Well, Billy Graham has said it. Joel Olstein has said it. A great number of people have said it. Witches will say it. Just do good to people. Just be good. Just do good things. Like, like you said, it's your sincerity. Well, Brother John, how do I get back to my car? Well, if you're sincere, you'll find the way. No, I need directions of how to get there. There is no right way. Just follow your heart. Just be sincere. Right? Yeah. Same thing. It only took Brother Paul two months to figure that out, but now he understands it. <laughs> Me neither, brother. <laughs> C.S. Lewis says this on page 129. He says this, As I believe Christ fulfills both paganism and Judaism. Now, I want you to listen to this quote. At Daphne, it was hard not to pray to Apollo, the healer. But somehow, one didn't feel it would have been very wrong. Would have only been addressing Christ's subspecies, Apollos. He said, it wouldn't have been wrong to pray to Apollo. Who's Apollo? Well, he's the god of the underworld. Who's that? He's, he's Allah, <laughs> Muhammad, in a lot of people's minds. But the god of the underworld is a fallen angel that runs the underworld. Apollyon. That's who it is. In Revelation, that's right. You're going to see him come out with his army. Scorpions. Oh, that's just figurative in C.S. Lewis's mind. How come those things are figurative in C.S. Lewis's mind, but in all his witch and his 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 witchful writings and all the stuff that was full of witchcraft? How come none of that was fit just figurative? How come that was very real to him? In his book, The World's Last Night, and other essays on page 98 to 99, Lewis said, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now he's talking about Christ. He's quoting Christ's words, and listen to what he says about Christ here. Certainly the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. The one exhibition of error and the one confession of ignorance grow side by side. That they stood thus in the mouth of Jesus himself and were not merely placed thus by the reporter, we surely need not doubt. The facts then are these that Jesus professed himself in some sense ignorant and within a moment showed that he really was so. Still want to listen to C.S. Lewis? Still want to read his books? Watch his movies? That great. Who hath bewitched you? For long centuries, God perfected the animal form which was to become the vehicle of humanity in the image of himself. What's he preaching? Theistic evolution. I mean, boy, if he wasn't a witch, he sure did act like one. He sure did mimic one in all of his writings, and he sure did follow their theology. Why? Because he was a witch. That's why. The earth was created by theistic evolution, he said. He made an earth at first without form and void and brought it by degrees to its perfection. Theistic evolution. He says, nature's pregnancy has been long and painful and anxious, but it has reached its climax. No, it hasn't. The scripture teaches the exact opposite, saying the whole creation groaneth and travaileth. In pain together until now. What are we waiting for? The redemption. It hasn't reached its climax yet. The redemption is coming. Not when C.S. Lewis is mine, though. 
When we come to man, the highest of the animals, C.S. Lewis, when we come to man, the highest of the animals, we get the, the completest resemblance to God, which we know of. There may be creatures in other worlds who are more like God than man is, but we do not know about them. Man not only lives, but loves and reasons. Biological life reaches its highest known level in him. It's evolution. He's preaching theistic evolution. Well, and pagan witchcraft. Wicca. That's, I mean, that's what he's doing. Lewis was a follower of a religion called Teo. Teoism. You ever heard of that? Okay. Taoism is Chinese mysticism. It's mysticism, basically. He followed mysticism. It's all the same. I mean, where the, wherever it's from, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, he followed mysticism. He said this. He said, he said of the Tao, he said, which is from Chinese mysticism, that it is the concrete reality in which to participate is to be truly human. Lewis seems to see a common law of human nature that remains the same everywhere, regardless of whether people know God and his ways or not. In his book, The Abolition of Man, Lewis calls this supposed universal law the Teo, based on the ancient Chinese religion Taoism, symbolized by the yin and yang. The following excerpts are from page 5 and 6 in Mere Christianity. He says this, Taking the race as a whole, they people thought that the human idea of decent behavior was obvious to everyone. And I believe they were right. I know that some people say the idea of a, of a law of nature or decent behavior known to all man is unsound because different civilizations and different ages have had quite different moralities. But this is not true. There has been differences between their moralities, but these have never amounted to do anything like a total difference. Yeah, there is a total difference in a lot of them. There's a total difference in America, and there's a total difference in China. There's a total difference in all these countries, the way they treat their... I mean... Anyway, if we really follow the law of nature, why in the world, if there, if there was this universal law that he speaks of, now I understand there's a law of nature that God has made us with that we know when we're doing wrong. That's not really what he's saying, though. If anyone will take the trouble to compare the moral teachings of, say, the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Hindus, Chinese, Greeks, and Romans, what will really strike him will be, we how, will be how very alike they are to each other and to our own. Some of the evidence of this I have put together in the appendix of another book called The Abolition of Man. But see, it's not true, because if you look at the cultures of Greece, Rome, and other cultures, they were different. And they, and Babylon, I mean, come on, really? Babylon? They didn't have an underlying uh, love for life. The reason why America is the way it, way it was, or even has a remnant of it left, is because of the Bible. Mysticism... C.S. Lewis said this, Mysticism is a means by which one can leave this world before death. Now, if you're a witch, you have to understand what he's talking about. He's talking about an out-of-body out of experience. He's talking about, um, help me out here, I forgot the word for it. Uh, when they, no, when they uh, project, astral projection, that's what he's talking about. Phew. Leaving their body in the spirit. You know what that is? Leaving your body in the spirit, leaving your body and traveling. Say, they can't do that, can they? Yes, they can. Do I know how? No, and I don't want to either. I have no desire to know how they do that. Just working with a lot of ancient demons, devils is what they do. Anyway, he says this, I do not at all regard mystical experiences as an illusion. I think it shows that there is a way to go before death out of what may be called this world. One thing common to all mysticisms is that temporary shattering of our ordinary spatial and temporal consciousnesses and our discursive intellect. No, he wasn't. Not at all. Lewis claimed that he did not attempt the precepts like the saints and mystics do. He's lying. But um, anyway... He's basically talking about out-of-body experiences. He's talking about leaving his body. He's talking about this is, this is mysticism. This is okay. This is good. No, it's not good. There's nothing good about mysticism. It's wicked. It's spiritism. It's wicked in the sight of God's eyes. It's, it's mystery Babylon, which he was a part of. 
Now listen to his view concerning the Bible. He says, I have the deepest respect for pagan myths, still more for myths in the Holy Scriptures. Wait, wait a minute. He just said the Bible is full of myths. Lewis believed that all myths point toward God, and therefore pagan myths could be respected. He believed that the, that the sum of the myths in the Bible were that some of the myths in the Bible were true, such as Jesus' life, while others were not, such as creation. He didn't believe in biblical creation. He said on page 110, Job is unhistorical. Now, why would a mystic or a witch tell you that Job is unhistorical? Because that is the height of God's dealing with man. It reveals a lot of God in that book. He, God reveals his power in that book. And I can see why witches would absolutely hate the book of Job. All the Bible, but I can see how they would absolutely hate the book of Job because God dealt and God also showed. What did God also show in the book of Job? He showed what Satan is all about in the book of Job. He showed you how Satan works in the book of Job. He shows you how those devil spirits work. He showed you where the fallen sons of God were and why they were there and what they were charged with. He showed you the spirits that would walk before men and the back of their hair would crawl or the, would rise and they would, they would get that feeling. Why? Because they were being... Because devils were there. He showed you the spiritual workings of Satan and everything else there. What does the devil want to hide that? He doesn't want you. Well, I mean, if the book of Job is unhistorical, it's unprofitable, then what do you do then? You just don't, you don't worry about it. Then you don't know. Then you're ignorant of Satan's devices. Page 110 and 112, he says, there is error in the Bible. He said, the Bible carries the word of God, but it is human material. David Cloud says this, he says, the iner this is a preacher that uh, exposed C.S. Lewis as well, the, the, the inerrant inspiration of scriptures is a fundamental of the faith, but Lewis denied it. In a letter to the editor of Christianity Today in February 28, 1964, Dr. W. Wesley Schrader, First Baptist Church, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, warned that C.S. Lewis would never embrace the literal, infallible view of the Bible. Next, in the historicity of the Bible is a fundamental of the faith, but Lewis denied it. He believed that Jonah and Job were not historical books. In his article, Modern Theology and Biblical Criticism, Lewis said, Jonah, a tale with, with as few even pretended historical attachments as Job, grotesque in incident and surely not without a distinct, though of course edifying, vein of typical Jewish humor. Modern Theology and Biblical Criticism, Christian Reflections. What was he saying? He said, well, Job is about, Jonah is just a book of Jewish humor. It wasn't real. I mean, it was just a book of humor. So you think C.S. Lewis, you think you should read his writings? You think you should, you know, read his books and watch his movies? What he said about literal six-day creation, he said, uh, David Cloud says this, little, uh, the literal six-day creation is a fundamental of the faith, taught from one end of the Bible to the other, and placed at the very heart of the gospel, the literal fall of man, but Lewis denied it. He believed in theistic evolution, calling the Bible's creation count, account a Hebrew folktale. He said that man is physically descended from animals, I have no objection. For centuries, God perfected the animal form, which was to become the vehicle of humanity in the image of himself. The creature may have existed for ages in this state before it became man. In the fullness of time, God caused to descend upon this organism a new kind of consciousness, which could say, I and me, which knew God and could make judgments of truth, beauty, and goodness. C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain. What's he preaching? Evolution. Thus something originally mere, merely natural, the kind of myth that is found among most nations, will have been raised by God above itself, qualified by him and compelled by him to serve purposes which of itself it would not have served. Generalizing this, I take it that the whole Old Testament consists 
of the same sort of material as any other literature. Chronicle, some of it obviously pretty accurate. Poems, moral and political diatribes, romances and whatnot, but all taken to the service of God's Word. What was he saying? He's saying it's just like fictional material that you read. Part of it's true, part of it's not. Which part is true then? Which part do you base your, base your eternal life on then? The human qualities of the raw materials show through. Naivety, error, contradiction, even as in the cursing psalms, wickedness are not removed. We read in Genesis 2 and 7 that God formed man of the dust and breathed life into him. For all the first writer knew of it, this passage might merely illustrate the survival, even in truly creational story of the pagan inability to conceive true creation. The savage pictorial tendency to imagine God making things out of something as the potter or the carpenter does. Do you realize what he's saying? Yeah, he's, he's, he's saying, God, I mean, come on, you really believe that he actually formed man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? You really believe that? That part of the fictional story? You believe that? Wasn't that just allegorical? Wasn't that just, I mean, was he really being serious about that? This guy's a witch. He's burning in hell right now, too. Nevertheless, whether by lucky accident or, as I think, by God's guidance, it embodies a profound principle. For on any view man is in one sense clearly made out of something else, he is an animal, but an animal called to be or raised to be, or if you like, doomed to be, something more than an animal. On the ordinary biological view, what difficulties I have about evolution are not religious. One of the primates is changed so that he becomes a man, but he remains still a primate and an animal. He is taken up into a new life without relinquishing the old. He says, we can become scrupulous or fanatical. We can, in what seems zeal, but is really presumption, embrace tasks never intended for us. That is the truth in the temptation. The lie consists in the suggestion that our best protection is a prudent regard for the safety of our pocket, our habitual indulgences, and our ambitions. But that is quite false. Our real protection is to be sought elsewhere, in common Christian usage, in moral theology, in steady rational thinking, in the advice of good friends, and in good books, and if need be, in a skilled spiritual director. What was he telling you right there? He was telling you to trust in, a, in everything. But do you notice, what, what did he leave out there? Does anybody know what he left out there? In everything. I want to read this to you again. We can become scrupulous or fanatical. We can, in what seems zeal, but is really presumption, embrace tasks never intended for us. That is the truth in the temptation. The lie consists in the suggestion that our best protection is in a prudent regard for the safety of our pocket, our habitual indulgences, and our ambitions. But that is quite false. Our real protection is to be sought elsewhere, in common Christian usage, in moral theology, in steady rational thinking, in the advice of good friends and good books, and if need be, in a skilled spiritual director. Yeah, but what did he leave out? Bingo! He left the Bible out. Yeah, and the Lord, like you said, salvation, he left it out. Why? Just go to people, go to strong thinkers, go to philosophers, go to everything else. Wait a minute, C.S. Lewis, why not the Bible? Why do we leave the Bible out? Why would you leave the words of God out? Listen to me. Listen to me very closely. If that isn't enough right there to tell you that that man is a burning, wicked, rotten, heretic, then hang on, I guess, for a couple more messages on it because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill some more home. I'm going to show you how he practiced witchcraft in his writings, how he, how he, how he proved witchcraft, and then I want to show you his friends that he hung around with, who, he, who his buddies were, who his friends were that he hung out with, and what they believed, and how the guy that he followed the most and how he loved was George MacDonald. You ever heard of a guy named George MacDonald? You ever heard of him? Some of you have heard of him because C.S. Lewis recommended his book. 
that he wrote. You know what his book was called? Here's a little preview for, for the next message down the road here, whenever that's going to be. He wrote a book called Lilith. Anybody know who Lilith is? Anybody at all know who Lilith is? Well, Lilith is a demon, that's right. It's a, it's a, it's a false god, or it's a uh, fallen angel probably. But Lilith comes from the Kabbalah. And Lilith was Adam's first wife. Wait a minute. I thought Eve was the mother of all living. Well, that's right. But if you read the Kabbalah, no, 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 no. If you read the Kabbalah, what you find out is a Big Bang took place. Oh, wait a minute, I thought Darwin invented a Big Bang. I thought, I thought science, scientists invented a Big Bang. Oh, no, 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 friend. No, the Big Bang came from the Kabbalah. Evolution came from the Kabbalah. Oh, it was taught long ago by devils. Uh, don't be deceived. Scientists and doctors today, they, 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 they wear their, their wizard and their witchery wardrobes behind the scenes. They don't, they don't wear them in front of everybody to see. But, the, but, but these philosophers and most of these scientists, they follow the same thing C.S. Lewis did, witchcraft and devils. And that's what this man followed. And this man's best friend that he, he said that this guy was his mentor. I'm giving you a hint for the next message. But he said this guy was, but you'll forget it by then anyway. So um, you will, you'll forget it. But his mentor, he said, the guy that I followed the most was like my, he taught me everything was George McDonald. George McDonald was, he was removed, he was from back in the 1850s or whatever. He was removed from his church over in England. You know why? Because he was a heretic. And they knew he was a wicked witch. And if you read his writings about Lilith, Lilith was the first book that was ever written that talked about that mirror to the other side. The externalization of the hierarchy started back then. They were starting to reveal their hand. And yes, Yes, they had, they, had, they had plenty of help with it. Now I'm going to bring you back to some scripture, and then we're going to go eat. Amen? All right. I'm going to take you back, and I want, you, I want to remind you of some scripture here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing for his ministers also be that if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Well, his end is according to his works. And C.S. Lewis was a lion in a witch's wardrobe, and he is burning in hell. And his, and his writings are wicked. And his lies against the Lord are absolutely atrocious. And his, and his anti-Christ spirit, you can see in all of his writings. Look at what he said. He had this, this anti-Christ spirit. He sounded like Billy Graham talking and Joel Olstein talking and all those other guys. They're saying the same things. Why? Well, because Joel Olstein is a witch. That's why. He speaks, he speaks his witchcraft. He speaks things into existence. Speaks them into existence. Got to say it the right way. If you say it the wrong way, you'll speak damnation. You gotta say it the right way, he says. Why? Because that's a witch. Because see, my God is, is all knowing. The Lord Jesus Christ is all knowing. He's omnipotent, he's all powerful. God knows what your heart wants and desires. He knows what the truth is. God knows where you're going. If you said something wrong, the Holy Ghost of God knows it and he knows what you meant because he's not stupid. He's also not a witch that does incantations like Joel Olstein and some of these other men like C.S. Lewis. Want to know where this generation was trained? C.S. Lewis. See, some of you brought the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe in your house. Now, the title ought to got you. I'm going to be honest with you. Part of, part of me wants to just be like real upfront with you and tell you that the title of the book should have gotten you. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe should have been enough. Enough said. Right? Come on. I mean, right? That should have been enough said. Why would I let my children read The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe? Maybe not a good thing for my kids to read. So there's a call to repentance just on absolute plainness of speech. 
Why would I let my children watch that? Why would I let them? And then, the, the, then when you start talking about, well, we'll get into it. I don't have time to get into it today. That's another message. We're going to go because I'm going to pick that up in the second or third message, whichever, however long. I do. If I can fit it all into one, maybe I'll do it Wednesday night and push it all together into one big message on his witchcraft and his mentors. He hung, them out, he hung out with some pretty bad people that did not love the Lord Jesus Christ. That George McDonald was an absolute heretic. He didn't hang out with him, but he followed all of his writings. All of his writings are full of Kabbalistic uh, garbage and witchcraft, all of it. Now, who trained them? Then you find out, well, who trained, who trained McDonald? Who did McDonald follow? Well, there's a man named Swedenberg. Have you ever heard of him? Swedenberg, anybody ever heard of him? Brother Aaron, you ever heard of that man? There's another man that he followed. Well, who was that guy? Well, that guy was, he was just straight in the occult. Like he didn't have, I mean, he, I mean, uh, uh, he taught the same things as theosophy and a few of those other things. Okay. So, I mean, he, he didn't pull any punches. So all these people are all connected all. And, and, and so if George McDonald learned from Swedenberg, if he learned from him um, and C.S. Lewis learned from him and they all were preaching the same thing. See how everybody, see why you have to expose things like this and you have to talk about things like this. Why? Because I would, you would not be entertained by devils. That's why. I don't want you to have fellowship with devils. That's why. Father, thank you, Lord, for your words. Thank you for the truth of it. Thank you for the exposing of it, of this wickedness, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that those that are, I, Lord, I honestly pray that people would burn any C.S. Lewis books that they have any movies they have they would repent of it get their hearts right with god lord and get that witchcraft out of their house it's wicked in the sight of god's eyes it preaches another gospel another jesus it's witchcraft and it's and you said lord that you will judge that and father i pray that your people be not entertained with devils in jesus name we pray amen